Good afternoon, everybody. This is Dr. Palacios, and I am very happy to bring you this video on iron deficiency anemia. So in this video, we're gonna take a look at what is iron deficiency anemia, how does it differ from other forms of anemia, what your doctor is likely to tell you, what are some treatments from the conventional, the naturopathic, and on the holistic side of treating this common condition. So let's take a look at the presentation and I'll see you there. All right, hello again, everybody. Here is the presentation on iron deficiency anemia or also known as ferropenic anemia in the Latin words. So as fun fact that you may or may not know, this is actually the most common and widespread nutritional disorder in the world. What you'll learn is that iron is a type of mineral that the body needs. And as you see, it's gonna be very crucial for our blood. So let's take a look at what it does and what it is. So what is iron deficiency anemia? Well, just like the name says, there is a deficiency or a lack of iron in the system. So as you see on this little list, we have lack of iron in the system that lowers the production of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a protein that allows oxygen to bound and provide energy to the tissues. Everywhere in our bodies are made of tissue and cells. So if you don't have enough hemoglobin, you don't have enough oxygen, and without enough oxygen, you have tissue oxygenation decrease, which means your cells do not get that much energy and you will not be able to produce all the necessary metabolic functions that your body needs to, ca needs to carry on a daily basis. But what we see in this picture is the red blood cells, as you notice, they look like little donuts, but they're not hollow per se, they're just a little depressed. In the middle, there's just a little depression and that helps the red blood cells to go through the little vessels throughout the whole body. Because from your tip of the head all the way to the big toe, these blood vessels need to reach oxygen. They need to provide oxygen for our tissues. So we have homeoglobin, hemoglobin molecules, and that provides oxygen to bind. That's how we get oxygen from our breathing, from the lungs. We get oxygen in, and as we exhale, we exhale carbon dioxide. And hemoglobin also allows that process. So hemoglobin is a very essential component in iron deficiency anemia. And as you may know, Without iron, hemoglobin is going to be affected. So pathophysiology. So pathophysiology, what is really going on? Now, how do we get iron deficiency anemia in the world? Well, first of all, we're gonna see that there is a low intake of iron in the diet, usually from not eating enough sources of iron. And we'll talk about what are good sources of iron in our food supplies. But you also have to take a look at the age group that are prone to be a risk because of blood loss. So for example, we have menstruating women, which on, on a monthly basis, they're going to have their menstrual cycle and they're going to lose blood through that. So if women are not keeping check with their iron and energy levels, that could lead to a deficiency. Um, breastfeeding women is another group that tends to have low iron because a lot of the nutrients that pregnant and lactating women uh, save, it goes to the baby. And breastfeeding is no difference. And then we have what we call the teenage growth spur. So teenagers. Now, remember, women who are teenagers and are showing their first signs of menstruation, they are already have prone, but because of the growth spur, they're gonna need more iron in their diet to catch up with all the metabolic needs for 
just normal function. So a, a growth spur is going to require more iron in, than normal. So that also involves males and females in their teenage years. And then on a more extreme situation, we have blood loss. So let's, let's say you had an accident or you had a severe cut and one of those tended to be some form of artery or vein and then blood just, you're losing a lot of blood. So because of that, you're going to be losing iron as well because of the blood loss. Now that's a more emergency situation which needs to be addressed at the hospital as soon as possible because you may need blood transfusion with that. Now let's move on to signs and symptoms. What is going on? What may you be experiencing if you have iron deficiency? Now, because iron is so essential to so many functions in our bodies, it's very hard to tell and pinpoint what exactly is the, the, the main symptom. So we have a plethora. We have a lot of different symptoms. So some of this, as you see in the picture, are going to be about low energy and fatigue. That's going to be the main one to remember. Uh, sometimes you may get headaches or just general pain. Uh, chest pain is common. An increased heart rate is also common. Dizziness. And then here we have brittle nails and a smooth tongue. Now, those are things that the doctor may or may not check, but it's important that you at least mention that to them because it could lead it could provide some inputs as to your iron being low in your system. Now, diagnosis. This is more on a little bit more scientific minded, but I'm gonna make it as painless as possible to explain what are the doctors looking for so you can have a proper diagnosis. Remember, when it comes to diagnosing diseases, it is important to have a system of diagnosis and a requirement so we can provide the correct treatment. So when, how do you, would they find out? Well, first they're gonna take your blood and they're gonna send it to the laboratory for samples. And they're gonna look at all different kinds of lab values. So one of them is hemoglobin, just like we talked, and hematocrit. So the hematocrit is the concentration of how much blood red blood cells you have in the system. Red blood cells, again, they are the ones that are attached to the iron and you see it in the picture, many red blood cells. That's what they are. And hemoglobin attaches to that. They are in the red blood cells and that's what they grab oxygen with. So we're gonna have a decrease of that in iron deficiency anemia. And just like we see it in anemic blood, we have fewer, fewer red blood cells because we're, we don't have enough iron, we don't have enough hemoglobin, so how can we make more red blood cells? Um, low mean core cellular volume, low ferritin, low serum iron, and then the other one that's high, it's transferrin. So transferrin is a protein that grabs on to iron and because the body already has very low iron in the system this protein is going to try to catch as much iron as possible because it is going to be a reserve for other metabolic needs so as you notice there's a lot everything is on the lower end and the red blood cells are going to be a little bit smaller because of that too so that's what the blood work is going to suggest and the other thing too is, yes, you may have the blood work, but that's not enough to just diagnose you with iron deficiency anemia. You also need to have some of the signs and symptoms that we saw previously. Now, differential diagnosis is what else could it be? Let's say you are tired, you are fatigued, you may have headaches and you do have an anemia, but what if it's not iron deficiency? And that is a possibility too, because there are different forms of anemia. And these are some of them, but in the lab, we're gonna see different values. So just like we saw low iron in iron deficiency anemia, these other forms of anemias are high iron. Now, just 
as an aside, remember that anemia just means low red blood cell count. Doesn't mean low iron count, just means low red blood cell count. So here we're gonna, we may have a normal or a, or a high iron, but still have low red blood cell counts. Thalassemia, this is a term that you may not be aware of, but that's what it looks like. You have a normal red blood cells, which are nice little cylindrical shape or yeah, you would say cylindrical or circle-ish shapes. And then the thalassemias, you notice that they have different shapes. Some are circles, other are a little oval. And then there is the common sickle cell anemia, which is a form of beta thalassemia under the umbrella of thalassemia. And that is very common as a genetic trait. Uh, thalassemia is a genetic trait per se. Now, sideroblastic anemia is a little bit different from iron deficiency anemia because sideroblastic is the, basically the baby red blood cell that hasn't achieved this size. So they are tiny, they're smaller, and they are not going to work as well as a normal red blood cell. Again, this is another form of genetic condition where people are born with this. And lead poisoning, it's another common symptom that could be, could mimic iron deficiency because lead inhibits the formation of hemoglobin and iron to come together and make the right amount of hemoglobin to go into the red blood cells. Then we have this word called aplastic anemia. So aplastic anemia is the bone marrow. So you have your bone, let's say my arm, and any inside of the bone itself is what we call the marrow. The red marrow, the yellow marrow. The red marrow is what makes all the red blood cells that the body needs. But there are some people that have a, a hereditary dysfunction with that, a gene issue, and they start making less and less. Sometimes it can be another problem which one of this could be cancer, where the red blood cells and the white blood cells are just made in low amounts. So it's not a problem of hemoglobin and iron consumption, it's a problem of the, of the red bone marrow. And then autoimmunity form of anemia, which is hemolytic anemia. Now this is a very dangerous form because this is the red blood cells basically bursting in, in the blood vessels. And that could cause accumulation of iron deposits in our circulation, which could lead to some organ and tissue failure. So that's, this is a very, very, it's a rare form of autoimmunity, but it is very serious. So moving on to the next, so sequelae. So let's say you had iron deficiency anemia, but you don't do much about it. What could happen if you leave it untreated? Well, it is gonna be a very detrimental problem and it's what we call chronic iron deficiency anemia. Your attention deficit is going to be affected. That's gonna lead to a poor quality of life. And if you have heart failure as a previous condition, the mortality, risks is going to increase due to the low, the chronic iron deficiency in your system. So if you do have iron deficiency, make sure that you're treating it correctly and taking care of it before it goes to a worse condition such as chronic iron deficiency anemia. Now the workup. So let's say, what can the doctor do to follow up? So the doctor may send you to a hematologist. Hematologists are specialties in blood. Uh, so they're gonna take a look at your blood work. They're gonna do all the blood work that we saw on the diagnosis part. They could also take a look at your gastrointestinal tract. Maybe they could do an X-ray, a CT scan of your a gastrointestinal tract. So your intestines, your colon. And the reason they do that is to check for any bleeding in case you may have some type of internal damage. That's why it is important whenever you have an accident and you think you're okay, you should consider 
going back and getting the right image in so we can rule out any form of internal bleeding because that is the worst form of bleeding because we don't know where it's coming from. Another one is called fecal or cold blood test. And the doctor performs a, a form of stool analysis, but they check for blood, which means that maybe the rectum is bleeding, maybe the later part of the gastrointestinal tract is bleeding, such as the colon, the rectum, or the anus. Sometimes it's not very obvious, but it can be possible too. And then they'll probably refer you to a dietitian if it is a diet problem where you're not getting enough iron from your foods. Now let's take a look at the conventional treatments, what your doctor might do at the clinic if you have been diagnosed with iron deficiency anemia. And it all depends on the severity. You may just be given oral iron supplementation, pills like you see at the bottom right. Uh, they can do blood transfusion. Remember, if you have a lot of blood loss, they might need to find a donor so you can get the right amount of blood before it becomes to a dangerous event. Um, you could also get an IV injection on your, on your veins, get some iron, go through that, and some private practices provide that as well so they can get the iron levels higher. But it's not gonna be as fast as the blood transfusion. And then lastly is cooking with an iron cast, just like you see at the picture below. Now for naturopathic treatments, what else can we do for iron deficiency anemia? Well, because we focus a lot on diets, we tend to understand forms of hemoglobin that works very well with iron so we can absorb it in our system. So one of the things that we've learned is that heme, heme or the heme group, which is part of the hemoglobin protein, can be found in different forms of meat and vegetables. Now, iron can come from heme or not heme. So when it's, so heme with meat and without meat. So iron, Without meat, it's gonna be a little bit more difficult to absorb because it's harder for us to accept or assimilate. So what we do is provide iron with vitamin C and sometimes with garlic and onions. If you can cook garlic and onions with the dishes that are supposed to contain iron foods, they're going to increase your intestinal absorption into your system. So consider that. There's also natural supplementations of um, iron pills that can be vegan and vegetarian because there are some herbs that provide high levels of iron. And the dosage can be between 18 to 15 milligrams of iron a day. Now again, your dose may be that, your dose may be a little higher than that, it all depends on your assessment. Uh, there's also the vegan and vegetarian adaptation because we do work with all forms of population. So we have to respect and understand that there are people who are not going to consume meat even when they have a condition of iron deficiency. And it's not necessary because you can intake your amount of iron being a vegan or a vegetarian. So some of the foods that could be high in iron besides meat are this. So blackstrap molasses, spinach. Now classical medicine, these are, this is kind of like an overall of the traditional medicines we before we had the conventional medical world. So think of medicines in China, Tibet, India, that they refer to in their, in their past. Hippocrates, even Sina, they all had different forms of medicine. And I call it classical medicine because they all talk about the elements. How can we balance the elements so the human body can be in synchronicity with the outside? So the inner elements can be in synchronicity with the other elements. So doing some exploration in that regard 
I try to take as a simulation of what iron deficiency anemia is in respects to that holistic viewpoint. So some of you may understand this well, others, please keep, keep up with me. I think it'll be, make sense. So what this is, is a water element deficiency or a water element problem. Water element is all about filtration, circulation, and the ability for nutrients to go into their respective destinations. Now, the problem will be considered a weak blood because the blood is not receiving all the nutrients that it needs. And the deficiency symptoms are very much what we spoke about with blurry, blurriness, fogginess, fatigue, lack of sleep, and so on. So one of the things that you can do is to introduce nutrient-dense foods. So even though it's iron deficiency anemia, you don't wanna just think about iron, iron, iron. You also wanna think about other minerals and other vitamins because iron does not work by itself. It has cofactors, it has other helpers that are needed. So besides just focusing on iron deficiency or iron foods, iron filled foods, just think of having a more nutrient dense foods with you. So more meat if you can, more vegetables, more antioxidants, less sugar, less stimulating foods. The next thing is about the environment. So because the water element is considered weak, the body is likely to feel cold. Therefore, the environment needs to be on a warm region. So if you're in a warmer place, it's going to help build up the symptoms and provide some form of relief. Now, if you're in a cold region, just make sure that you're warm at all times. And because the moment you get cold, your body might have a hard time to recover from that. Uh, other forms of meditation that you can try are control of emotions because the water element has a connection to the mental aspect of the emotions and the heart and how much we can control that. So having a sense of not controlling emotions, being triggered very easily, reacting to things, that is considered in the classical medical world as a water element imbalance. So if you notice that the water, that you're having these symptoms, it could also accentuate that the water element is in a weak spot. So for that, you could also help trying to do moon related visu visualizations. The moon is very much connected to the water and the cool sides of the body, the cooling aspect or the yin. Now, I don't want you to think that the moon is related to the feminine energy. I mean, if it does for you, great, but I don't wanna make that into a universal truth because not all cultures see the moon as a feminine energy. Some other cultures actually see it as masculine. But I just want you to focus on the moon related visualizations. So please find some of those. I would be happy to provide some other techniques along with that as I make more meditation videos later on. And when it comes and when it comes to exercise, last thing here is please be careful overdoing it. If you're going to exercise because you already have a bad circulation and a weak blood per se, you have to take it easy. You can't work to the point that you're sweating, like sweating to the point that you're drenching in sweat. A little sweat, a little sweat, sure, why not? It'll warm you up. But if you're losing too many fluids, that's also going to be part of losing more minerals in from your system. So thank you so much. This is the bibliography. If you guys want to check out some of these websites on where you like to learn more about iron deficiency anemia, please feel free to check them out. And last thing here, please feel free to subscribe and support the channel. And here's my contact information if you'd like to learn more about the Zen Palace of Healing, what I do as a naturopathic doctor, 
and where you can find more educational videos in my YouTube channel. So thank you again, everybody, for listening to my presentation. I hope this was helpful and insightful to understanding and learning more about iron deficiency anemia. And remember, if you suspect somebody from having that problem, or if you yourself suspect to having it, go check it out. Just get your blog work done, and that'll help you uh, finally get an answer to your problems. And if you like to do it either on the conventional, the natural, or the more holistic path, please feel free to let me know and I'll be happy to provide the right support for you. Thank you so much and have a good rest of your night.